Hey guys, another video on vectors here. So a lot of times when we have vectors, we're trying to find a resultant. And a lot of my students really don't understand what a resultant is. So what I want to explain to you is, you know, from my background as an engineer, if we've got a body that has two or three or four or five or, or ten forces on it, a resultant is what would happen if I combined all those forces into one force. Okay, one force. It is a combination of all the different forces. And what, what would the equivalent one force be that's the same as all 10 of those combined? Okay, that's, that's the way I like to think of it. Um, vectors don't always have to be forces, but forces make the most sense in my mind. There are two ways. There are two ways that you can find a resultant. The first is called the parallelogram method, and the second is called the component method. There are pros and cons to both. So I'm going to start with the parallelogram method. Okay, so the parallelogram method says, hey, you got a vector here. So this is vector one, and you got a vector here, and this is vector two. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, take this vector here and copy it. I'm going to draw it as a dashed line. Okay, so if I pick this up and set it up here, or pick this one up and put it here, you don't actually have to do both. A lot of people think the parallelogram method says you have to do both. You only have to do one, okay? Um, pick V2 up and put it here. That puts these vectors where? From head to tail, okay? Or you can pick V1 up and put it here, right? head to tail, okay? So the big thing about the parallelogram method is the vectors must be, must, whoops, must be head to tail. So when you draw your picture, you're gonna have the head of one vector touching the tail of the other vector, okay? So this picture here or this picture here are both correct. You don't need both of them, you need one of them, okay? Sorry, and let me mark this, right? If this is V1, this is also V1. And so what you end up with, let me come down below, is you end up with this. Or you end up with that, okay? You end up with these two pictures here, okay? Let me slide these up so you can see them. So you end up with either that picture or that picture. Half of a parallelogram. And here's what we get. If I go from the tail of the first to the head of the last, this is V1 plus V2, which we call the resultant. Okay, if I go from the tail of the first vector to the head of the last vector, this is V1 plus V2, or what we call the resultant, R. Okay, now, why is the parallelogram method handy? Well, in high school geometry, and hopefully again in trigonometry, we talked a lot about triangles. So we have lots and lots of formulas to find the sides of a triangle. Okay, and the two that we use for the parallelogram method are going to be the law of sines and the law of cosines. Okay, law of sines, law of cosines. And I'm going to put these on here for you just to help you out, okay? The law of sines says something like this. It says A over sine A equals B over sine B equals C over sine C. And you're going to take your finger and block one of these and use parts of this equation, just parts of this equation, not the whole thing, right? So we could say this equals this and solve for the unknown, or, or this equals this and solve for the unknown, okay? And if you've seen this before, hopefully you know that A and B and C are your sides, 
and A, B, C, your capital letters, are your angles, okay, sides and angles. Now, one last thing to keep in mind is that side A has to be across from angle A, side B has to be across from angle B. If you're not doing that, you're going to get incorrect answers. And I'm going to show you guys how to use this in a minute, okay? And then the law of sines is a little harder to memorize, but lucky me, I have it. Okay, C squared equals A squared plus B squared minus 2AB cosine C. That's one. There's three of them. B squared equals A squared plus C squared minus 2AC cosine B. And again, these little letters are your sides, and the big letter is the angle. And then A squared equals B squared plus C squared minus 2BC cosine A. Okay, so law of sines, law of cosines. Okay, so if you're dealing with two vectors trying to find a resultant, you can use triangles and you can use methods that you've learned hopefully to solve those triangles. That's why this is a handy method. I'm not a fan of this, and I don't use it, and I'll tell you why. Typically, in engineering, we will have more than two vectors. Sometimes it's three, four, five, six. Well, two vectors and a resultant make a triangle. Three vectors and a resultant make a four-sided figure. Four vectors and a resultant make a five-sided figure. We don't have formulas for four and five and six-sided figures. So this only works if you have two vectors and a resultant. Okay? If you have more than two vectors and a resultant, you need to use what's called the component method. Now, the way the component method works is we break everything. Okay? We break everything into x and y components. And these tend to be called vx and vy. x components of the vector, y components of the vector. Now, there's a cool thing that happens here. All of the x components are horizontal, so you can add them together. All of the y components are vertical, so you can add them together. And I'll show you how we do that. I actually make a table to do it. Okay, so there's some equations that'll show up in any physics book, um, pretty much any math book, uh, and I've done this in a couple of previous videos that, that you need to go look at. I've got several videos that are titled Vectors. Go look at them. There, there's a lot of information in them. Okay, V of X is going to be the magnitude of the vector, right? So if I tell you a vector's 30 newtons, 100 pounds, whatever, that's the magnitude times the cosine of the direction angle. And the y component is going to be the magnitude of the vector times the sine of the direction angle. And then here's what I do, guys. I'll take these vectors. So I'll take v1, v2, v3, right? And I'll make a table. Make my little table here, okay? Okay. And here's what I'll do. If you give me two, three, four, five vectors, doesn't matter how many, I'll take this vector and I'll use these equations and I'll break it into X and Y components, right? And so I'll say, you know, let's say 30 and 70. And then I'll take this one and I'll use these two equations and I'll break it into components. I'm just making up numbers here. And let's say I get 50 and negative 25, okay? And then I break this vector into components and I get 100 and negative uh, 105, right? Here we go. My resultant vector is going to be, you take these three guys, and they're all pointing in the horizontal direction. Just add them up. Literally just add them up. So 30 plus 50 plus 100 is 180. And then 70 minus 25 minus 105. Well, those two sum to negative 130. Okay, so 70 off of that is going to be negative 60. Okay, these are the X and Y components of the resultant. These are the X and Y components of the resultant. And I'm going to do an actual example with these and show you what that looks like, okay? So here goes. Number one, 
we got a ship. It travels north 22 degrees east for 145 miles. Then it travels south 58 east for 210 miles. How far is the ship from the port? This is a perfect problem for the parallelogram method because I'm given two vectors and I'm asked to find the resultant. So I'm going to use the parallelogram method to find this. So here we go. Okay, north 22 east. So we're going to take, here's our port. Here's our port. And north 22 east means we go north 22 degrees and remember, if you're dealing with directional problems, never eat soggy waffles. Or I heard someone say never eat sour watermelon. But anyway, north, south, east, west, right? So, anyway, so north 22 degrees east means you start here and you go 22 degrees towards the east axis. So that's how I got that. And we know that this is 145 miles long. Okay? That's vector 1. Then they said south 58 east for 210 miles. So I come up here. And okay, so this guy goes south. And we're going to go 58 degrees towards from south towards the east. So this is going to go over here somewhere. Okay? It's going to go over here somewhere. Okay? So this is 210 miles. And we know that this is 58 degrees, right? Because we went from the south towards the east, okay? There's my two vectors. And what did they ask me for? They asked me for the resultant. How far is the ship from the port? Okay, so what we have is a triangle, guys. And we can use the law of sines or we can use the law of cosines. Well, to use the law of sines or the law of cosines, you have to know two sides and one angle or two angles and one side. Okay? So, uh, I look and I say, well, I know this side and I know this side and I sort of know something about this angle. Now, here's the reason the parallelogram method sucks. If you don't remember your high school geometry, you can't solve this. So, in high school geometry, we had all these rules about parallel lines. And this is a north-south line here, and this is a north-south line here, and they are parallel. And this angle and this angle are what are called alternate interior angles. And alternate interior angles are equal. And so I know this is 22 degrees. If you don't know that, you should not be using the parallelogram method. Okay, and I'll show you the other method in problem two, and you can come back and try it on this one and compare the answer. So, here we go. I know that this is 22, this is 58, so this total angle is going to be 22 plus 58. Okay? So it's like 80 degrees. I think. That sounds right to me. Okay, so I got 145 miles 80 degrees, 210 miles. Okay? And then I pull up my, my equations here, right? I got law of sines, I got law of cosines. And what I'm going to realize real quickly is I'm looking for R. And if you label that A, B, or C, I know the angle across from what I'm looking for. And if you look at the law of cosines, right, there's the angle across from that side, there's the angle across from that side, there's the angle across from that side. I want to use the law of cosines for this problem. Okay, so I'm going to use the law of cosines, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to name this guy A, and this guy B, and this guy C, and this guy big C, okay? And that's going to be my equation, okay? So C squared equals A squared plus B squared minus 2A B cosine C. Okay? And I'm going to do all this math. And where most people screw this up is they screw up in the math. So what I'm going to do is actually show you what how I do it. Okay? So I'm going to take 145 squared, write it down, and I get 21025. And then I'm going to put 210 squared, and I get 44100. 
And then I'm going to take and say 2 times 145 times 210 times cosine of 80. So I'm going to type all of that in and write whatever I get. And I get 10,575.2. Okay, I'm just going to round that off to 0 0.2. Now I'm going to combine these three. Okay, so take 21,025 plus 44,100 minus 10,575.2. And what do I get? I get a mess because I got my calculator in the wrong mode here. Okay, um, so I get that. So I get C squared equals 54549.8. This is not my answer because it's squared. I need to take the square root of both sides. So if I take the square root of that, I get C equals 233.558, you know, five, five, blah, blah, blah. Most folks would call this 234 miles, okay? So that is the length, if you round to the nearest whole number, of this side. We're 234 miles from port, okay? If you do not remember all of your rules about parallel lines, you don't want to use a parallelogram method. Hint, parallel lines, parallelogram. See the correlation there? Okay, so I'm going to show you a different method. Not with a ship problem, but with a problem where you can't use this. Okay, so you get into physics, and the physics teacher says, okay, we've got four forces acting on this particle, right? So we've got one, two, three, four forces acting on this particle. Find the resultant force or the net force okay so they're asking you for the resultant okay they're asking you for the resultant now a couple of things you got to realize each one of these dudes has an angle so here's what we're going to do we're going to write 80 newtons 55 newtons 90 newtons 140 Newtons and the resultant. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. Okay. Now, for me to use my formulas, right? So for me to use my formulas, let me throw those up here real quick. Magnitude times cosine of theta, magnitude times sine of theta. Those are my magnitudes. That times cosine of theta will give me that. That times sine of theta will give me that. Okay? Boom, 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 boom. Problem. Theta has to be in standard position. Okay? I got a whole video just on standard position and how to find it. Okay? So... What I'm going to do is beside of each one of these in blue, I'm going to write their standard position angle. Now, 55 newtons is easy. It's 20 degrees off the x-axis, so he'll be 20 degrees, okay? So this guy will be the cosine theta, and this guy will be the sine theta, okay? He's 20 degrees. This 80 Newton force, you see this 40 degrees. If you put 40 degrees here, everything over here is wrong. If you look, he's 40, he's 20. This is 60 degrees. From the x-axis to this vector is 60 degrees. Okay? Now, third one, 90 Newtons. We need to go from here all the way around to here. Okay? Okay? Well, this here, this, this negative y-axis is 270. So from 270, I went an additional 30. So this is going to be 300 degrees. Okay? And then last but not least, our 140. And I'm going to do him in green because the drawing gets really cluttered up really quickly, right? So we're going to go from here. We're going to go all the way around to here, right? That's our standard position angle. Well, this guy... Here's a 40 degree angle. Here's 270. If I take 270, I'm actually going back 40 degrees from 270. 
So this angle here is going to be 270 minus 40. Okay, it's going to be 270 minus 40. Okay, and that's going to give me 230, right? So this will be, let me write it in blue again. This will be 230, okay? 230. And here's a hint. If you know that little picture from high school geometry, right? Right, this is 90, and this is 180. And I think most folks know this, right? There's 270, there's 360. What do I know? 300 degrees is between 270 and 360. Well, that's where he's at. That makes sense, right? 230 is between 180 and 270. It's got to be here. That makes sense, right? So I'm going to start plopping some numbers into my table and I'm just going to show you how I come up with those. So I'm going to throw my calculator up here so you can see it. Hopefully that's not too, too glary, okay? Okay, and so for this number here, I'm going to type 80 cosine 60. And for this number, I'm going to type 80 sine 60. And I'm going to round to one place. Uh, and it really depends on what your teacher wants from you or what the problem wants from you. Okay, here I'm going to type 55 cosine 20. 51.7. Here I'm going to type 55 sine 20. 18.8. Okay, and again it's the same thing. It's going to be that times the cosine of that. Okay, that times the sine of that. So this will be cosine, this will be sine. Okay, so here. 90 cosine 300, 45, okay? 90 sine 300, negative 77.9. And by the way, if you used these angles in the drawing, there is a way to get these numbers with those angles, but it's very complicated. And I'm doing my videos to help folks who are not getting it. Okay, if you want to get it, don't try to do it the most complicated way. Keep it simple, okay? If you use standard positions, start here at this x-axis and go counterclockwise every time, these numbers will always be right, okay? So one more. This will be 140 cosine of 230, and I'm going to call that negative 90, and 140 sine of 230, and that's going to be negative 107. Point two, okay? Now I want you to look at these components for a second, right? Positive, positive. We'll look where this vector goes. Positive, positive. Okay? Positive, positive. Okay? Let's look at this 90 Newton vector. Let's look at this 90 Newton vector. Where does he go? Positive, negative. Huh? Positive, negative. It's pretty slick. You see how you can kind of check these numbers? Let's look at this 140 Newton. Where, where does he go? Left and down to get to here. Huh. Left and down. Negative, negative. So, anyway, something that, that really helps some folks out. Now, here's our last step. Well, our, not our last step. Our next to our last step, okay? I got these numbers. They're all horizontal. I can add these up. These numbers are all vertical. I can just add them up. Okay, you cannot add these numbers up because they're in all different directions. These are all in the same direction. I can add them up. They're all in the x direction. So I'm going to take my handy dandy pocket brain and I'm going to type 40 plus 51.7 plus 45 plus negative 90. Or you can just type minus 90 if you want to. And I'm going to get 46.7. Okay, then I'm going to come here 69.3 plus 18.8. Uh, minus 77.9, and then minus 107.2, and I'm going to get negative 97, okay? These are the X and Y components of the resultant, okay? But I don't want the X and Y components of the resultant. I want the resultant. Okay? Well, if you go back to my Vectors Basics video, every vector has an X component, a Y component, 
and a magnitude. Okay? What we have right now is 46.7 for the x direction, negative 97 for the y direction, and what we want is this guy. Anybody who's watching this who's never seen a vector in their life but has had middle school math, if I say this is this, this is this, they can find that. It's Pythagorean's theorem. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take 46.7 squared plus negative 97 squared, and that's going to be equal to what? R squared, right? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm going to start squaring stuff. Okay. So this is 9409. And 46.7 squared is 2180.9. I rounded slightly. Add those together. If I can hit the right button. I get R squared equals 11589.9. Then take the square root of both sides. And I get R equals 107.7. Now, all of these vectors were in Newtons, and so this resultant will be in Newtons. Okay, so I've got four forces, 80, 55, 90, and 140. When I added them all together, I could replace them with one 107.7 Newton force. This is nearly impossible using the parallelogram method, which is why I work most of my vector problems this way. So, um, but, but this is kind of a quick overview of both ways that you can work a vector problem. Which way is right is really up to you. If you're going to use the parallelogram method, you've got to know your geometry. Okay? Um, if you know this method well, it works every time regardless whether you have two, three, five, ten vectors. So this is how I work all of my vector problems. Unless someone specifically comes to me and already has the triangle drawn and says, can you please work it this way? Okay? Um, and, and that's really just because I know this way works every time. And I get this nice neat table, so I kind of organize all my data and I don't lose anything. So I hope this helps you with your physics class or with your trig class or maybe even with your engineering class. If you have questions or you want to see other videos, Leave them in the comments.